This is Trend Following Radio, where great thinking comes alive. Nobel Prize winners, legendary traders, best-selling authors, and the pros that know what drive us irrational human beings. I am your host, Michael Covell. Not filtered, raw, honest. That's my passion. Let me go back in time. 1972, Munich, Germany, the Olympic Games. My guest today was there, and he failed. How did he fail? He got a silver medal. That's right. He failed because he got a silver medal. That's how he viewed it. Anything less than gold, failure. In his mind, that's how he viewed it. He came back to America. He rededicated himself and he developed what he calls mental management because he knew his error that cost him the gold medal in the Olympics was in his own mind. And he knew he could fix it. He didn't yet know how he could fix it. And there's quite the backstory about how he learned how to fix that mental side of the equation, but he did. And at the next Olympics, he got gold. My guest today is Lanny Bassam. I hope you enjoy this conversation because, wow, it's one wild ride of inspiration. Because if Lanny doesn't inspire you, I don't know what to say. You've got no pulse. You've given up. But for those of you out there that still like to know that you can get there, you can get ahead, you can make it happen, Lanny brings the wisdom. So, Lanny, I've been doing my podcast for several years now, uh, 500 episodes almost. I've had, I think, five Nobel Prize winners. I believe you're my first Olympic gold medal champion. So, I appreciate you taking the time today. Oh, I'm happy to do it. Let's go back in time a little. I think you have a great story, and I think it'd be I think it'd be a fair fair way to say it that it's a great underdog story and an underdog story overcoming every obstacle to get to the highest point. A lot of twists and turns there. But I would love for you to take me back to you as a young guy, a really young guy, because I think you have a great story about when you were a youth and perhaps the teacher talking about getting a gold medal and some of the other kids talking about who in the class might get a gold medal. And I don't want to give too much away. Why don't I let you tell that story? Everybody has a, a kid in school that they don't want on their team. And that was me. I was uh, arguably the worst athlete in school. I was slow, short, uncoordinated, kind of the smallest kid in school for the longest time. I mean, I played alternate right field in Little League Baseball. I mean, if you play baseball, that says it all. I mean, you put your worst player out there, and I, I couldn't make that team. I was, uh, I think, in the sixth grade. When we're studying Olympics in school, and the teacher made the statement in class, you know, it's possible somebody in this class can be an Olympic champion someday. I wonder who would have the best chance. And this little boy sitting next to me jumps right up and says, teacher, I don't know who would have the best chance, but I know for sure who would have the worst chance, Lanny. And that was kind of a turning point in my life because is that who I am or am I somebody else or what can I do about it? I was a little miffed and I go home and tell my parents about that. My father was a military officer, kind of a tough guy, a battlefield commission in World War II and all that. And my he just kind of he just told me that I hadn't found a thing I was good at yet. And my mother, on the other hand, she said, Oh Olympics, huh? Well you want to find out about the Olympics? Let's go to the library. So we checked out all the books about Olympic champions and I started reading these books. And I found out that they, every single one of them had obstacles. Uh, Wilma Rudolph uh, had polio as a child. was told she would never walk, and she ends up winning three gold medals of track. And all of them kind of had a, a message that ran through there that what you, the world thinks you are is maybe not who you are. It wasn't long after that, a friend of mine 
invited me to a rifle club meeting. I had no idea what that was about. I mean, none of the books that I was reading had anything about shooting, and we didn't have any guns in the house and everything. I asked him, I said, well, tell me about rifle shooting. He said, it's an Olympic sport. And I said, are you sure? <laughs> you know, because I hadn't seen anything about it. He says, oh, yeah. He says, it's been in the Olympics since the modern Olympics started. And I said, okay, how tall do you have to be to be a rifle shooter? Well, you don't have to be very tall. I said, okay, how strong do you have to be? And he said, well, the rifles aren't that strong. And, okay, how fast do you have to be to be a rifle shooter? You know, he said, why are you asking me all this? And I said, well, I'm, it's Sintius, Altius, Fortius. That's the Olympic motto, the stronger, higher, faster. He, he says, wait a minute, you don't understand. He says, uh, in Olympic rifle shooting, to be the best shooter in the world, all you have to do is stand still. And I thought, well, maybe I can do that sport. <laughs> I said, stand still. So I went to the rifle club meeting, they let me shoot, and, and I was hooked from the very beginning. It was a great thing to find that. They had this one weekly program. My father took me, and that's all I talked about all week long was uh, going back to the rifle club meeting. And I was about to meet my first obstacle very quickly, because when we go back to the uh, rifle club meeting the next week, the guy running the program gathers us around and says, um, we got some bad news. We're not going to be able to shoot tonight. As a matter of fact, we're not going to be able to shoot at all. Uh, we have a problem with the range. We're closing the program down. It's it's over. And I'm walking out of there with, uh, with my dad. And I look up at him and I say, I think this is the most disappointed I've ever been in my entire life. He said a incredible thing to me. He said, uh, I don't want you to worry about this. I'll take care of it. I'm your dad. I'll pick you up from school in a couple of days and I'll give me a couple of days to figure this out. So a couple of days later, he picked me up and he had got the keys to an indoor range nobody was using and uh, began to teach me how to shoot. And 15 months later, I'm national junior champion with a rifle in my country. Let me go back to something, though, that I think is really important. That young, that other classmate of yours that that made fun of you. Now, I was one of these guys also that was not that great of an athlete early on as a baseball player, and I kind of overcame. And, you know, as a 12 year old, I wasn't very good. They put us on the big field at 13. I, I started to become much better. And I had a lot of that same kind of stuff probably come at me as a young guy, too. How did you really feel, though? I mean, you clearly, some people could hear that and perhaps get beaten down. How did it? phase you emotionally or did it or you did you just say you know what i'm going to prove everybody wrong what was motivating you from that moment oh i mean i think the first the first motivation i had was uh i think what most people would do i was offended i was offended that he would say that but then i started realizing he was absolutely right there was nothing that i was doing that by the standards of the sports that are common in high school or in, in school period there was nothing that I was contributing or doing that was that was going to get me anywhere because I was slow and I was short and I was uncoordinated a little bit. It, it wasn't that I didn't have, I didn't hustle and I, I showed up on time and, you know, I worked as hard as I could, but I'm, I'm never going to, I'm never going to be compete with a guy who's, who's tall, strong, and coordinated in a sport where those kind of talents are demanded. I think what my mother was trying to get me to see was that obstacles sometimes lead to opportunities. And that's exactly what happened to me. It was fortunate that I was uh, approached by a rifle program by a friend of mine. It makes you wonder sometimes if life doesn't have some patterns out there that obstacles happen, but also opportunities happen. When my father uh, started coaching me, he didn't know anything about target shooting. And so he had to find out about it. And he spent, he found out there was a marksmanship unit in the, air, in the base that he was stationed at. And he'd go over to the marksmanship unit and get information about target shooting and come back and teach me. Now, I didn't have anybody else on the range for the first year, which is, I found out, would find out later, that's a big advantage. When you don't have anybody training with you, you don't have anybody that's distracting you. You don't have anybody to compete with. You don't have anybody to hear complain about uh, how hard this is. I was forced to work on me and compete against me 
which um, you know a top athlete will tell you that's what that's what you do. You compete against yourself. You don't worry about what other people do. Well, I didn't have to worry about it. There weren't any, there were no other people. Also, my father developed a reputation after he started talking to some of the guys at the marksmanship unit. Uh, next thing you know, he's heading up that marksmanship unit. He was so good as a coach that he was picked up by the United States Army Marksmanship Unit at Fort Benning, Georgia. We were reassigned there, and the reason that was important to me as a shooter is the United States dominates Olympic rifle shooting, and all of our shooters are at, at that time in history were, were at the marksmanship unit where my dad worked. So the best shooters in the world were at where, where my dad works. So I had an opportunity to, to meet those people and, and get and find out exactly what was it going to take. And all of them told me the same thing. You know, you go to college, you get a college that has a shooting sports program, you take ROTC, you make All-American, and when you go in the Army, you go to the Army Marksmanship Unit, they provide you with the resources necessary to compete. And that's exactly what I did. When you mentioned that you, you really went in 15 months to be a national junior champion, can you speak to the amount of practice that you were putting in every day? And how old were you at this time, exactly? Well, I was, uh, this was uh, 13 and 14. This is the period of time I was won my first national championship at, uh, I'm not sure if I was 13, or I'd have to look, look that up. But, but it was in that range. My idea about practice was that uh, practice was never something I had to do. Practice was something I got to do. I would find out later that when I started working uh, with elite performers, that passion is one of those things that uh, the top people all have. You know you have passion when uh, practice is not something you have to do. It's something you get to you do. You were there as long as you could be until they told you you had to go home. Yeah, I, I would have shot seven days a week if, if the opportunity would have been presented itself. But you know, it, and it wasn't so much that I, that I that I loved rifle shooting so much. I mean, I, I I did. I liked rifle shooting, but I liked rifle shooting for because it was something I could do, and uh, I was never going to be a, good, a great baseball player. But I could do rifle shooting. Now, I, if somebody had me a golf club, I I would have been just as excited about golf, or, or had me a bow. I would have been just as excited about archery because those are things that that you, you don't have to be tall or strong or fast to do those sports. Looking back on it, I wish somebody had have handed me a golf club. I'd be rich <laughs> but instead of a rifle. You make a great point here about passion. So many people today, they, they, they don't start anything. They just say, I'm looking for my passion. And maybe they go their whole life looking for their passion. You're kind of saying something different, aren't you? I think a lot of times it, it's the most important thing is how you respond to obstacles that are placed in your life. If you really think about it, most of the time in our lives, when we're handed an obstacle, it, 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 there's really an opportunity there. Most people choose to take the obstacle as something that's happening to them. Now, if you look at my life, the times when I thought something was happening to me, in reality, something was happening for me. For example, if I'd have been even an average baseball player, I never would have wanted to go to the Olympics. If that kid had not said that in that class, my Olympic dream was born that day. Okay, it's another class about the Olympics, so what? I wouldn't have read those books. I wouldn't have been inspired. If my father hadn't have extended, if, if I'd have gone to the Rock Club meeting and said, well, it's canceled, and my father had simply said, well, too bad, why don't you try something else? But, but he didn't. And the fact that, that my father ended up being my coach instead of the guy that was there was a huge benefit because he got us to Fort Benning and got me in, in touch with the, the best shooters in the world. So my first, first year of training, there were no other shooters on the range. And then all of a sudden, we, get, we moved to Fort Benning when I'm not seeing any shooters my first year. And, but we get to Fort Benning, now the, I'm, I'm piling around with the best in the world. The serendipity of life, huh? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. You just can't look at everything that happens to you. Well, let's, let's, go, let's take my story one step further. I get to the Army Marksmanship Unit on a team. There's 22 guys on the team, and there's six world champions on that team. I mean, they really didn't need me coming out on the, on the team. 
And the coach told me, he says, uh, you know, we have this little war in Southeast Asia and, and um, a, lot of, a, lot of, a lot of pressure on us to cut our team size back. And so I'm going to have to cut the team. And unfortunately, I have to cut the new guys and keep the veterans unless you can beat the veterans. So basically, you've got six months to be in the top four or I'm going to cut you. So I had, I had six months. So what do you do when you have to go around three world champions to stay on the team? Well, you get you get to you get to work early. You stay late. You shoot more shots than anybody else. You ask more questions than anybody else. You you develop a work ethic. I developed that work ethic. It got me in the top four. It got me it gave me an opportunity to stay there. It got, and that work ethic managed to to get me world ranking, but it didn't allow me to win tournaments for the first three years on the U.S. team. I don't remember winning anything. I mean, every time I'd shoot a great score, one of my teammates, uh, who all had world titles and Olympic medals and things like that, they would all they would beat me. And finally, I make an Olympic team in 1972. And we had to only take two shooters from each country you're allowed to go to the Olympics. So I managed to get the second slot. My teammate uh, Jack Ryder was world champion, uh, reigning world champion, held the world record. I'd never beaten him, but in practice, uh, my practice floor started getting sort of surpassing his. So we go to the Olympics in, in uh, Munich in 1972, and I'm thinking, I've got a really good chance to beat him. He's not worried about anybody in the world but me. And I'm thinking the pressure's all on him because it's favor to win. How old were you when you got to the 72 Olympics? Oh, I don't know, 24. Okay, okay. Like I want to have some perspective so people can follow your story. Maybe 25, something like that. that, that in that range. So we, we, we're in Munich. I'm thinking he might choke. I got in a competition and he didn't choke. I did. And I didn't see that coming. And I lost more points in my first half of my program than I normally lose in an entire program. And it wasn't until I lost so many points that I thought it's impossible for me to medal that pressure came was, was gone. And then I shot great. And I, and I realized that, oh, I know why I haven't been winning. I don't have a mental, a mental game. As it turned out, he won a gold medal. I ended up winning the silver only because my last half of my program was, was, was so good. But I realized that I could have won that gold medal if I had a strong start, if I had a good mental, mental start. Most people would think a silver medal, okay, perhaps... You know, it's number two. It's pretty close to the top. It's it's a big achievement. You win the silver medal in the Olympics, and you immediately break down your entire process. Here's the problem with a silver medal. Now, don't get me wrong. Silver medal is 10 times better than a bronze. A bronze is 10 times better than no medal at all. And, and most people never have a chance to even make an Olympic team. So I'm not putting down any silver medalist in the world, believe me. But there's a big difference between a silver medal and a gold medal. It starts when, when you come home and people ask you, oh, you were in the Olympics? Yeah. Did you win anything? Yeah, I won a silver medal. Oh, who won the gold? You know, nobody is, is reminded more that they didn't get the job done than a silver medalist in anything. It's like the first runner-up. Uh, like, like tell somebody running for president who doesn't make it that it's the same thing as making it. T tell, talk to the first runner-up in, uh, um, in, in, in the Miss America contest. Talk, t talk about the, the, the team that went to, goes to the Super Bowl and doesn't win. You know, yeah, you did really good, but... You did really good, but, and I think the silver medalist is probably more motivated to win a gold medal than anybody in the world. So I came home from the Olympics wanting to take a course on how to manage your mind under pressure. And when I couldn't find one, I, I, I realized that I, I didn't really need sports psychology. I needed to know how to win. And what happened that, that you were able to self-diagnose during that silver, that silver medal performance, what did you know that you were doing wrong that you needed to go find the fix? Well, it was pretty obvious. Your practice scores are better than the, the tournament scores. You, did, you didn't forget how to shoot when you, the, the day you went into the, the tournament. You forgot how to think. 
you weren't thinking the same way in the tournament that you were thinking in practice. So obviously it had to do with, with, with your mental game. But I needed to know, okay, I know I'm not mentally strong. I know I'm, I'm, I'm not delivering in tournaments like I, was, like I was shooting in practice. But how do I fix that? You know, first of all, I had to find out. I, I knew it was mental, but I didn't know exactly what was wrong. I wanted to take a course. I wanted to find somebody to tell me what, what, what's the answer. So it wasn't until I made a decision that I'm going to interview Olympic gold medalists to find out what they're, what they're doing different than what I'm doing. Now, rifle shooters are not going to tell me anything because I'm, I'm a threat to them. But other sports, would, were, I found, were, were more open. So for, for the next two years, I interviewed Olympic gold medalists and world champions of all kinds of sports to find out what, what they were doing about the mind and what they were thinking and what What's different about these guys? And I, and I found out that 95% of all winning is accomplished by 5% of the participants. And the major reason those 5% win all the time is, is, that, is the way they think. I started seeing some patterns develop. I started to realize this is system to this. And it's not being taught. And I didn't know it. And so I connected the dots, created a system, and First opportunity I had to use it was the World Shooting Championships in 1974. And I ended up winning three world titles uh, there and walk away with 15 medals. Eight of them were gold, four world records. And I'm number one in the world. Two years later, go back to the next Olympics. I've got mental management now. I've got my system. And now I'm in the same position that Jack Ryder was in four years earlier. I'm favored to win. I won all the pre-Olympic competitions. I'm a silver medalist in, in the previous Olympics, just like he was. But because I've, I have this training, because I'm, I have a system, uh, I was able to win the gold medal in 76, and, and then two years later, won a gold, world championships. Again, we have world championships in shooting are every four years. So you are you have a world title every other year available in, in the sport. And so for about six years, I pretty much dominated my sport because uh, – because I solved the problem, and the problem was the mental game. Looking back on that, I, I, I think the best medal I ever took was the silver in 1972, because the silver medal gave me mental management. It gave me this incredible opportunity to teach this program to other people. And the next year, we'll be in our, our 40th year of teaching mental management to uh, to folks let's 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 break some of that apart so you've got this great book out called with winning in mind people should check that out because we can't cover everything in the book today but i think one of the big picture issues that you break apart is process versus outcome and it seems like in my world too that this is this is it the people that that, that figure out that the process is where you want your focus to be. And if you're sitting around thinking to yourself, I just need to hit a home run, I need to hit a home run, you're never going to hit the home run. But if your process of what you need to do each time when you step into the box is to have the right kind of swing and prepare, et cetera, et cetera, then you've got a chance. Why don't you, from your perspective, talk about process versus outcome? All right. First question you have to ask yourself is how important is consistency? Well, consistency is everything. If you take a sport like golf, because we, we teach uh, some of the, many of the top uh, PJ Tour pros, our, our program. And you, you talk to a PJ Tour player, and you say, oh, you know, this is a sport of variables. Uh, probably more variables on an athlete in golf than in any other sport. Well, in a sport of variables, anything that you can make a constant is a huge advantage. My sport was a sport of constants. There's almost no variables. The target's the same size. It's always 50 meters away. A 10 rings the size of an eraser on a pencil. The only real variable in my sport was the wind. But in a sport of constants, anything that's a variable is a big problem. So, so consistency is huge. Consistency is super important in business. You want to have consistency, you got to think about this, that Outcome is a variable. It'll always be a variable. And you can't control it. You can't control what other people do. 
you can't totally control what you do because there are variables that uh, uh, that affect score, and score is in its in itself is a variable. If if you want to have a, a mental process that you want a mental consistency, you're going to have it's got to be a function of something that can be defined. Well, what can be defined is what you think about before, during, and after a task. Now, if that task is hitting a baseball, or that task is shooting a 10, or that task is hitting a golf shot, it's possible, and we teach people how to do this, how to determine the optimum thing to think about before the shot, during the shot, and after the shot. And once you come up with a mental process, which is a method, a way of thinking, when you determine the optimum things to think about, then all you have to do is train this optimal thing till it becomes like you to do it, till, till you master it, and you'll know that you're achieving mastery when you don't have to think about it anymore. You, 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 know, you get to the point where you, it's impossible for you not to do it. Uh, one of my favorite uh, quotes, and I don't know who said this, but if I can ever find out, I would quote them every time is that um, amateurs practice till they can do something right and pros practice till they can't do it wrong. Well, that's mastery. So you do it to work so often, so much, that you can't do it wrong. So I teach my tour players to develop a system that yields consistency. You, what you're thinking about is the process, is the mental process. Now, everybody has a routine, which is what you're physically doing, but I teach people how to have a mental process. What are you thinking about while you're physically doing that? Now, this is, this is so important. If you ask every Olympic athlete out there, or every tour player, or everybody that, that in a sport, that, or even business, and ask them, what percentage of what you do is mental? You're going to get a huge number back. The most common number I get is 90, 95% my sport, 90-95% mental. You ask them a second question. Well, since you've been doing it, if you spend 90% of your time and money on the middle game, they're going to say no. Well, there's something wrong with that. We don't spend enough time and money and effort uh, preparing ourselves mentally, and it hurts us. It hurts us in everything. It, it hurts us when you go into tournaments in competition, when you're in competition. When you don't know what, how to develop a pro mental process, then you're thinking about outcome which is going to lead you to mental inconsistency is going to hurt you. And I want you to take this a step further. And again, I really think people need to dig into your book to get the full picture. But I think you can start to illuminate for people. This is a really core part of your work. Speak to, in your work, your mental management, how the interrelation, the conscious mind, the subconscious mind, the self-image, how those all tie together towards performance, and it's all about balance. Why don't you speak to that? That's right in the heart of where your work is every day. Performance is a function of three mental processes. A conscious mind, what you think about, what you picture. The subconscious is your skills. And self-image. Self-image makes you act like you. Now, if you read most of the positive motivational literature uh, that's available and has been available and some great books out there and I'm, I'm a big big proponent of reading positive motivational literature they do a pretty good job of talking about well, here's what you need to, here's what you need to do now they're not too strong about how you do it but they'll tell you okay you need to be positive well that's true but what really happens is that if you know how to do something that you're aware of it you understand it does that mean it's like you to do it? I mean, how many people have uh, recognized the fact that, uh, you know, if I control control what I eat and I exercise more, I'll lose weight. They, they, they recognize that they know how to drop weight, but is it like them to do it? No, it's like them to eat what, what they want to eat and not, not, not go to the gym. And so self-image is huge in it. It, it, it becomes, it makes something, takes something from being informational, which is just being aware of something, and transformational is like you to do it. So what has to happen for performance really to work? You have to have 
skill. There's no question about it. You have to have skill. But a lot of people chase the skill thinking that's all they need. That's all they need is skill. But the problem is you can have skill, but if the thoughts that you have right before you perform are harmful thoughts, you won't reach the level of skill that you that you're available that are that's available to you. So the conscious mind is important. Controlling what you picture is critical. Controlling what you think about, you'll never have mental consistency if you can't define the optimal thing to think about before an action. And so that's a conscious circle issue. But also it's got to be like you to do it. It's got to be like you to train. It's got to be like you to, you know, to be confident in tournaments. It, it's got to be like you to do these things. It's, your training has to become, uh, when you learn something new, you have, it has to become transformational, not just informational. And that's, that requires a change in your self-image. And self-image changes through imprinting. When people, the most important thing that I, I discovered in all of this research that I've done and all the, the, the conversations that I've had with the top 5% all my life, the most important things, two most important things that I have learned. The first one is the self-image connection. That if it's, if it's not like you, you're not going to do it. This, you know, it has to do with attitude, it has to do with confidence and all that kind of stuff. But, but basically what was really important to me in self-image was this idea of how does the self-image change? I mean, I had a self-image was I'm not good at sports. That's the self-image that I, that I had. And therefore I was going to be good at anything because that, that's who I was. Well, at the time, the time that I won my uh, uh, first national championship, if you had asked me, well, what, how good a rifle shooter are you? I, I would have said I'm the best in the country in my age group. But some, something happened there. And, and it wasn't just the fact that I practiced a lot. It was the fact that, that th there was some imprinting that was going on in the self-image. And self-image changes through imprinting. You change the imprinting, you change the self-image, you change the self-image, you change what you can do. You change performance. That first self-image change that you're talking about at that particular age, the imprinting, what would have been, looking back in time, the, the particular imprint that would have helped you have that first self-image change? Because I would assume in your lifetime, you've probably changed your self-image many times in a positive way. Well, anybody, anyone can change self-image if you if you understand what those imprints are. And there are three major forms of imprinting. The, fir the first one is what actually happens. I mean, if, if you have a good performance, it imprints in your self-image is like me to have a good performance. If you have a bad performance, it imprints in your self-image is like me to have a bad performance. But fortunately, there's other ways that, that the self-image is imprinted. And the second one is the one that you really have to control. And that's, you know, I call them imagined imprints. Every time you think about something, you become it. So every time you think about, uh, for, for a golfer, correct, every time you think about a, a good golf shot, you improve the probability of having a good golf shot. Every time you think about a bad golf shot, you, it, you, it becomes like you to have a bad golf shot. So you got to control what you think about. What the top 5% do is they think about what they want to have happen. They don't think about the problem. They think about the process of getting it, of, of making a good shot. It's also what you talk about, what you say to other people. You go to almost any tournament in, in almost any sport in the world, and you, go, you ask the people in the middle of the leaderboard, how did you do? They're going to talk about what they did wrong first. The top people don't do that. The top people talk about what they did right first or what they need to do. They talk about, they're saying things that cause them to picture what they want to have happen instead of what happened. And that's a big thing that separates them. I, I was guilty of that until I started talking to these champions to realize that I've been beating myself up. When I made a mistake, I, I, I hurt over it. I anguished over it. I thought, gosh, I can't have this happen to me. Listen, all the problems. And so I was picturing problems, and every time you picture a problem, your self-image shrinks. Every time you picture a solution, self-image grows. And then there's writing. I wasn't keeping a performance journal. When you keep a performance journal, you write down what you what you learn. You write down what you what you want to do. You write down what you're doing well. You're improving the probability by writing that your self that your self-image is growing, and and writing. Uh, Produces more self-image growth than, than thinking or talking about it. 
self-image changes through what actually happens, what you think about, talk about, write about, and the people that you're around. The environment that you're around. If you're around positive people, you tend to be positive. If you're around jerks, you tend to be a jerk. You kind of need to control a little bit what you can control. And you can definitely control what you think about, talk about, write about. And to some extent, you can control your environment. Let me take you back on a a slight time warp again. Something that just hit me that I didn't ask earlier, which I think is important. After you got that silver and you went about on your mission to talk to these other Olympic champions, not in shooting, do you have any favorite stories of particular champions, if you want to name, and a particular thing they shared, an experience of meeting with them, something that just instantly was an aha moment going back in time? Because, you know, look, most people don't, you've got so many stories in your lifetime, but the idea of going around after you get the silver to meet with all these gold medal winning champions in other sports, that in itself is an amazing story. And I'm just wondering if you have any color you might want to add about any particular champion that you met during that time. I did a really dumb thing back then. And I, I, I was not really thinking about the people that I was talking to, that at some point in history, some point down the road, they, 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 would, they would become famous. If I'd have been halfway smart, I would have documented every conversation that I had. Who did I, who did I talk to? And they tell me, that would have made a great book. That would have made a great book. But I, it, it didn't matter to me whether I was talking uh, to, a, to a swimmer or to a, um, or, or whatever they were doing. It didn't matter. All I was looking for was the, was the, uh, was, was the answers. But two things, but I will tell you this, two things happened during this period of time that, 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 are, that are very memorable to me. The first one is that how open these guys were to talking to me. I got information I don't think anybody else in the world could have gotten because when you're an Olympic gold medalist and you get a phone call, you don't know this guy, but you find out that he's a silver medalist and he wants to talk to you. I was never turned down for, for, for uh, an interview with any of them. Every, as a matter of fact, they were so cordial to me. And most of the time, they would give me the name of somebody else to talk to. They would say, well, you need to talk to this other champion, or you need to talk to this other person. And so I got contact with people that, that I, I, just, I just chased, I just chased the, the, uh, the recommendations. And I just put down all, the, all of the, the, the things that I, that I heard up and concepts, I, but I didn't tag a name to it or, or a, a date or a time. The thing that probably shook me the most early on was how many of them told me that I was over crying. I didn't understand what that meant. See, I bought into the idea that the harder you try, the better you do. So I would go into a tournament, you know, just trying hard as I could on every show. And I was confusing hard work in tournaments with work ethic and practice. Now, you have to have a, a high work ethic and practice. But when you get into tournaments, it's very, you, you don't want to be cautious in the tournament. You don't want to be careful in the tournament. You don't want to be careless. There's a, to be careless is to undertry. To be careful is to be over, to, is to overdrive. There, there's, and they, they all told me, it says, everything that you do in life has a certain amount of effort to give it. If you give it 1% more effort than is required, performance drops. Well, I was overtrying all the time. And they told me, well, you need to trust, not try. You need to have confidence in yourself. You need to believe that your subconscious skill that you've worked so hard to develop is going to is going to pull you through, and not try to make it happen. You need to trust that it will happen. You need to trust, not try. That's huge, because most people get in a pressure situation and they try instead of trust, and they're over they're over trying. That probably changed my world initially and I had it now it, it took me a while to figure out how to how to how to uh, not over try I tried several things that uh, 
that didn't work. And finally, I found did, did find something that does work, and that is that you've got to concern, concern yourself with process, not outcome. You've got to be thinking about execution when you when you're performing, not what, not results. I tell my tour players, I don't want you to care where the ball goes. I want you to care how you get it there. When you can, when you can be so focused on execution, so focused on your mental process and your shot routine. Your shot routine is what you're physically doing. Your mental process is what you're thinking about. When you can control what you think about you when you're when you're 100 in control duplicating the th the optimum thing to think about before during and after a task and you're more concerned about that than you are about outcome then you'll be mentally consistent and physically consistent and your outcome is is guaranteed outcome will always follow process but if you're trying it won't work Great words of wisdom today. I have one more point that I would love for you to elaborate on. It's one of my favorites. It's it's a little reflexive and it feels very zen in a way, but the principle of value, and this is from your work, the principle of value, we appreciate things in direct proportion to the price we pay for them. Boy, that's true. That's just great. Yeah, I mean, do you, re do you really want it to be easy? Do you, do, you, do you really, really? I mean, why do people go to go to uh, universities that have a, a, a big reputation? That, because it, you're going to put out a lot of work. Why do people want to go to the Olympics? Because it, it's everybody knows how hard this is, and it, it's valuable because it's hard. It's valuable because we we, we sacrifice. It's valuable because. We've got skin in the game. We have put put out some effort. If you if you don't put out any effort, and you get something. I mean, how how much do you value some awards that are just get handed to you? You you, you didn't work for them. Uh, you just okay. You know we're gonna give we're gonna give a trophy to everybody. This is a competition. Everybody gets one. It doesn't mean anything. But you know if you struggle and struggle and struggle, and, and you don't have to be valedictorian to win. Uh, in, in, in academics, you don't have to be an Olympic gold medalist to be a champion. You you just need to get to make sure that when you perform better than you have ever performed in your life, when you you're going to value that because you 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 put out so much to get there. And I, I just feel like that people appreciate things. In direct proportion to the price they put on, and when uh, this this reason why you know free seminars, uh, how much how much you pay a whole lot more if you, if you if it really hurt you to go take that lesson, you're going to pay attention. If if you, you have to sacrifice to be there, if uh, and it's not just money, it's time. A lot of our clients uh, that come to us, uh, they're, they're sacrificing. They, you got to find a couple of days in their calendar. They've got to pay some travel time to get to our courses, and and uh, well, they pay a lot of they pay attention because they've got something in it. But if I'm asked to go speak to some uh, organization and I'm at their location and uh, somebody else paid the bill, um, guys in the audience uh, don't seem to be quite as attentive. And it makes sense, doesn't it? That's a great point, really. That is a that's a great point. I can't keep you, Lanny. The book is everywhere with winning in mind. Where can we send people? What's the best website, Lanny? Well, the best website to go to is mentalmanagement.com. Our focus today, my focus today, my is 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 to put these principles into schools, into public schools, into private schools. And we have a new program where uh, it's called What the Winners Know. If, if you want your kids to have this program in their high school, to give us a call, to con contact us. And there's some information on that website, mentalmanagement.com, uh, about What the Winners Know, a course that your kids can take in, in, uh, in high school as, as an elective in their schools. We're so excited about this because everybody that comes to our courses they all say the same thing. I wish I'd known this sooner. 
And I said, well, that's fine. Let's make it happen. So we've developed a curriculum, and it's being uh, it's being used in high schools now. And, and uh, we're so excited about getting this information out to the, to the young people of America so that it'll help them not only in their sport, but in academics and in their vocation in the future. Lanny, I appreciate you taking some time today. I think everyone is going to enjoy this. It's always nice to hear some of this type of wisdom from someone who has reached the highest reaches of their particular profession. And, you know, a gold medal does instantly tell people, as you've, as you've said today, and, it, you know, it really says, hey, you, you put the time in to get to the top, and you, you've, you've figured out a lot of lessons that I think we, we can all take to heart. So I really appreciate you taking the time today. Well, thanks, Michael. Appreciate the chance to talk to you. I see a time when those awake will understand how to make money in up, down, and surprise markets. Whether new trader or experienced, college student or financial advisor, protecting against a crash or just trying to make a lot of money, Trend Following offers everyone an answer in uncertain times. To get started immediately, send me an email, michael at covell.com. I will send you the right trend following steps to take along with my free video. But if you want to buy and hold, trust the government and trust Wall Street. This is absolutely not for you.